And today I have the honor of introducing our speaker, uh, who along with being an accomplished business leader and author, happens to be my uncle, and a darn good one at that. <laughs> Jack is here today to speak about his book, Lessons on Leadership, which he wrote in order to help pass on leadership skills that he learned during his career at Coca-Cola and Revlon. Jack started his career at Coca-Cola in 1979. Uh, he represented the company to Wall Street and led, and led the team responsible for planning and acquisitions. Just 36, Jack became CFO of the company, becoming responsible for all financial strategies and Coca-Cola employee. Jack moved on to become president and COO of Coca-Cola worldwide and served in this position until 2001. Next, Jack took the position uh, of president and CEO of Revlon and he was able to use his key understanding of branding and its relationship to its consumers to improve market share, reduce debt, and position the company for continued uh, profitability. Next, oh, sorry, Jack currently serves on many boards, including Dr. Pepper's Snapple Group, Boys and Girls Club of America, and the United Negro College Fund. Jack's book, Lessons on Leadership, The Seven Fundamental Management Skills for Leaders at All Levels, was published in 2007 and will be the basis for his talk today. <coughs> I think the eighth published skill may have been knowing when to shut up, so I'm going to go ahead and, and pass it on to Jack. Uh, thank you all very much. It's my honor to be here today. You know, I, I'm humbled in thinking about the fact that while I was at Coca-Cola for over 20 years, and I thought of Coca-Cola as a very big, very global company, I realized it took Coca-Cola 120 years to be a $20 billion company, something that your company did in only nine years. So that's quite an amazing achievement. And I suspect the parallel between the two companies is inside of each, there are some great leaders at all levels of both companies. And what I'd like to do today is perhaps provide a framework for thinking about leadership. Whether or not you manage people, it doesn't really matter. Some of you might manage projects, you might manage functions, you might manage a, a portion of a project or a customer relationship. And I think leadership skills and a framework for thinking about leadership applies across all of those ways of doing business. So that's what I'd like to share with you today. And to do that, uh, let me ask a question. I'm just going to take a quick poll. How many of you would think that as you think about leaders that you know that are effective, maybe it's your boss or a peer, it might have been a parent or a friend, uh, how many of you would say that leadership is something that's it's something that you're born with, it's an attribute that you inherited in some fashion uh, versus a skill that can be learned. I'm curious to how you would think about that. How many of you think of leaders as being born and have those skills? Okay. And those of you who think of it as a, a, a set of skills that can be learned over a period of time? Well, I can go home. This is a very easy talk at this moment. <laughs> Normally people tend to think of leadership as, as something that is born or inherited. I happen to believe, based on working with people for over 30 years, that you can think of leadership as a flow, as a flow of very concrete actions that over time can help you lead effectively and move an organization or a function or a relationship in a positive direction. And if you do those series of actions well, when things get crazy, you can be the emotional touchstone. You can be the center for what your organization or your function is trying to do. So I'm going to walk you through just one framework that I have found has been useful to me over a long period of time. And that framework starts with setting a compelling destination for your organization, developing a strategy and a plan, a lot of emphasis on communication, a focus on management routines, which are important in getting things done in a project environment or in any role. Execution, being visible for your people, and then developing the organization that you have responsible for. And I'm going to tr try to provide some anecdotes from Coca-Cola and from Revlon. Now remember, when you hear my Coca-Cola stories, 
This is from the company and the person that was very involved in developing new Coke about 20 years ago, which was probably the biggest new product disaster in the history of mankind. So everything I say you're going to have to take with a slight grain of salt. But there are some learnings even in that. So this is the framework that I'm going to walk through. And I'll start with setting a compelling destination for your organization. And I, I was interested to read when I did a Google search on Google about your destination, which was set out by your founders of organizing and making useful and accessible the world's information. And I can think about working here and having that being something that would pull me in a positive direction towards trying to make a contribution to the growth of the company. And I think in so many worlds, whether it's a religious environment or a business environment, people want something bigger to point to. And I'll give you some examples of my own past. At Coca-Cola, we were looking for a way, mind you, Coca-Cola had a very strong market share position, like a 45% share of market, as Google has a strong position today. But we wanted to, to move that up dramatically. And at one point in the mid-90s, we set a destination for creating what we called a 360-degree Coca-Cola landscape. Now, that, to some of you, that sounds a little bit bold and audacious, maybe a, a little bit obnoxious. But if you're in the beverage business and you're trying to grow it, the notion was having Coca-Cola be available within an arm's reach of desire, having the brand be preferred by consumers all around the world, and having the price and value of the product be right in consumers' minds, whether you were in New York City or in Beijing. The price and value had to be a right, had to be affordable. So setting a 360-degree Coca-Cola landscape became the goal, became the objective of our business in the United States. And I would suggest to you that in any role or any function, managing a project, managing a customer relationship, to the extent that you can set a of a destination that means something to the people that you're working with, you'll get there that much faster. I was amazed when we set this destination, we actually had a little mural done, it was kind of corny at the time, a little painting that, that actually pictured a Coca-Cola landscape with people and teenagers walking around with various Coca-Cola products and Coca-Cola was an important part of the community doing the right thing around the world. And it was amazing how many people had this up in their offices as a way of reminding them where the company was going. So an important part. At Revlon, which was a bankrupt company when I got there about eight years ago, we set a destination that was meant to be compelling, which was delivering the promise of beauty. And beauty to our customers, to women, means so many different things, both physical and emotional. And the promise of beauty meant delivering profits to our retail customers, whether it be drugstores or Walmart or whoever sold cosmetics, and to our share owners. So this was our destination that we set for ourselves in the beauty business. And again, it's amazing how people rallied around setting around a destination which they found compelling. So I think the first building block for strong leadership in any function is to think about how you set that for the activities that you're part of and the organization that you're part of or leading. I'm curious, in, in the roles that you play, how many of you are actually managing people versus performing a function or managing, say, a customer relationship? Do many of you have actually people management responsibilities? Okay. And to any of you, have, have any of you had experience or have you experimented with setting a de destination for your own functions or organizations that meant something to your, is that something you've done? I'm just curious. Sure, yeah. Okay. What's your function? Uh, I'm an account executive working across the different uh, sales teams. Okay. So driving, I guess, the, the main objective across uh, our patients' clients to focus on okay. uh, how much of a target to be. Okay. So, so having a destination then quantifying it makes it more real for your team and very good. Any other experiences in setting destinations that have been useful to anybody? I'm curious about your own experiences. Yes? We have um, we have here something called Coca Cola, which are our personal objectives that we write off in there on the plan to achieve our positive objectives and then larger focus area. Okay. Great. Beautiful. 
I think those can be very powerful. The next question, okay, once you've got a destination, great leaders always have, are very thoughtful about the pathways, the strategies, in other words, to get there. And I'm going to use a very historical example, and that's Ford Motor Company. Uh, Henry Ford invented the automobile for all intents and purposes. He mass produced it. And his strategy was to make the automobile affordable. And that's how he thought he could grow the industry. And, you know, in the way he got there was mass production. That became an important strategic tool for him. And the old saying went, you can have any color Ford you want as long as it's black. And he got people with an affordable car. It built the industry. And the rest is history. But he was very strategic about using mass production as a way of building his particular industry. And I think setting strategies or pathways are important for any leader in any function. So the beauty of a clear strategy is everybody in your organization can understand it. They can get their arms around it. It allows them to prioritize. It allows them to stop doing stuff that isn't on the strategy. And I would ask you as leaders, are you being clear enough about what the strategies or the pathways are that you want to follow for your area of responsibility? Yes? How do you galvanize people? Irrespective of how people are What is the system? When I use the word galvanize there, and I'll go back to the Coca-Cola example, we had set a destination of a 360 degree Coca-Cola landscape. We had three key strategies for getting there and it was so simple. It was the three A's. Affordability of the product, acceptability of the product, meaning the brand was loved, and availability of the product, which meant we wanted the product within arm's reach of desire. So, those three A's, affordability, acceptability, and availability, if an action wasn't tied to one of those three A's, then you were expected to deprioritize it. So every, all the energy was pointed in those directions. Galvanize is, you could think about it as focus. That's, uh, that's my way of saying focus, I guess. Does, does the word mean something different to you in that context? Did it trigger something for you? What, were you, what was in your head? I'm curious. Action of chemicals to editors. Ah, okay. Are you a scientist? Most of us are. Ah, okay. Well, let's use your word. Um, what's your name? Alexander. Alexander's point was galvanize is, in scientific work terms, the attraction of chemicals to an, an electrode. And this is attracting people's energy to a set of focus priorities. So it is a I think very similar. Thank you for that. But then the question becomes, are you as leaders making those tough choices? When I got to Revlon, the company was basically broken and bankrupt. There was a lot of money to be made serving men with men's products. People believe that men's cosmetics was going to be the next great thing. We had to get it right with women first, or we we're not going to be able to pay the bills. Or as somebody here said, we weren't going to be able to afford the cookies. We had to get it right by focusing on men and galvanizing energy around uh, focusing on women. Any other questions or comments on this? Um, yes? So how much of what you mentioned assumes that the person putting forward the strategy has the position of authority versus doesn't have that authority but someone is expected to do? Could, could you say that just a little bit louder? Uh, how much of what you have said assumes that the person who has put forward the strategy some kind of position of authority in the organization versus is designated to do the work without necessarily having a position of authority? Yeah. Um, I think both models work. I, I tend to think of this as situations where you have ownership for some level of work or activity without necessarily positional authority. So, for example, if you're on a customer team and you've got a customer relationship that is, it's a $10 million business today, you believe it can be a $20 million business, 
and you go about setting pathways to get there, that's not necessarily positional authority. And you may have coworkers that can help deliver against that $20 million goal, but I don't think it requires positional authority. I think it requires ownership of an activity more than positional authority. Does that address your question? So I do think it's broader than a traditional hierarchy. Any other comments or questions, thoughts or reactions here? Okay. And then with a strategy in mind, what about quantifying it? And, and this, I'm sometimes embarrassed to talk about this number, but I will anyway. Um, when I was asked to run the North American business, and this was in the mid-90s at Coca-Cola, people were actually drinking 400 drinks per person per year of Coca-Cola products. I mean, I can see the reactions in terms of health and wellness and the concerns, and, and those are very fair, and we did react to that. I'll talk about that in a moment. But we were in the business of selling beverages, and we thought to ourselves, if it's 400 today, where can it be in the future? We did some analytics, and we found out that it was 400 overall, but believe it or not, it was 750 in certain parts of southern Mississippi. And it was 675 in North Dakota, believe it or not. So we started asking ourselves the question, if it's 400 on average, but there are places that it's much higher, there must be places where it's much lower, like Southern California for one reason or another. If we can get the 75 up to 300 and the 300 up to 550, then overall, let's set a target of 600 drinks per person. And the organization looked at us like we were crazy. We, there had been about 50 of us who had developed this goal. But once we had set that goal, we went about setting the clear strategies and tactics to get us there. And it required us to introduce juices and healthier products and waters and teas and ready to drink coffees and a whole host of vitamin and rich products. And sure enough, seven years later, we, did, we didn't make the 600, but we made 550, up from 400. And only by setting a very aggressive target did it force a different set of conversations amongst our team about how to get there. It took more vending machines. It took a wider range of products, mostly healthier products than, than carbonated soft drinks. And so what I would, I would ask you as leaders, are you setting objectives that are stretch and aggressive enough to force a different set of thinking, different questioning of assumptions that can help propel your organization, your function forward? And I think it's critical to creating growth and value. Any questions or comments on this one? Because oftentimes this creates a little bit of angst about the idea of over pushing an organization or a, a group of people. And it can create a fair number of questions sometimes. Any, you're a salesperson. <laughs> Typically, it's the salesperson who jumps at me at this point. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. Okay. We had to think outside the box. Exactly. Yes, Alexander. Will the sales organizations of the world ever target a realistic number? As in targeting 550 and delivering 550? Yeah. Uh, Alexander's question was, and underneath it, really, would maybe, would you be better off targeting? 550 and achieving 550 than setting a, such a stretch goal. And you know, for me, it was never, it was never, I think if, you, if, if we'd set it at 1300 or 1100 or even 900, it didn't, it wouldn't have seemed credible. But something that was big enough to create a different dialogue, a different conversation, Go ahead. In other words, if you were to say 650, would you have achieved 600? Oh, I think we probably maxed it out. But I, I think my fear in the, in, when setting objectives is if, if you don't set them aggressively enough, you don't force different enough conversations. 
and people will go about with their same patterns of growing the business or dealing with customers or thinking about how they develop code. Only by setting a more aggressive target and can you help force people's thinking into different pathways. So, so that's why I think the numbers are so important. <coughs> yes, uh, Violet, right? Yeah. Well, I think to, set, to get to 600, we had to say to the organization, we're willing to invest another $500 million in vending machines, for example. We had to say that we were willing to build up our new product development department dramatically. So they knew that Coca-Cola was willing to invest behind that goal. And the other thing we did was we said, look, we're going to set our compensation systems up in a way where if you get to 550, over a six or seven year period of time, you're gonna be rewarded for that. You're not gonna get hit on the head for falling short of what seemed like a very aggressive goal. So I think it's a combination of resources and how you set the compensation systems that were important. Does, does that address your question? Uh, yeah, pardon me, I, I was looking for, you know, how do you, how do you empower people, like, have more managers and things like that, and how do you make sure that you can do that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to that directly in, in just a few minutes. But it, it did start with the strategies that got us here. I got input from probably 6,000 people as a leader. I traveled to every location in the United States. I was on every shop floor, as an example. I met with every salesperson in one form or another. And it was literally a two-way dialogue that shaped the strategies to get there. And so it did start with that. Yes? Yeah. The question was, how did we decide at Coca-Cola to go from carbonated soft drinks into a product like water? And, you know, it was grounded in consumer research. People, even 15 years ago, were increasingly calorie conscious. They were increasingly aware of ingredients that were listed on the package. We could see trends in other parts of the world. Um, we spent a lot of time, for example, in the Japanese soft drink market, which had if the U.S. had this much variety, the Japanese market had 15 times the amount of variety. And we began to see the, the consumer wanting more products on the shelves and in and out products and more excitement. And it told us that we had to extend the product line. And water seemed like, from a research standpoint, the biggest market segment that was first available to us. Yes. As a publicly traded company, how do you balance that stretch goal? And if it's out there in the world and you only hit 550, all the analysts say you failed and your stocks go through the floor. How, how do you manage that? You know, what's it's public and what's private? It's a great question. I, I, um, I was always a believer that the external communication needed to be con consistent with the ex internal communication. And while we might not have been quite as specific, we might have said, okay, 600 drinks inside, we want, we want to get there by the year 1999, as an example. With the street, we would have said, over the next seven to 10 years, we want to get to 600 drinks per person per year. So we were somewhat less specific, so it didn't turn into earnings guidance and quite as, as specific as that. But we were pretty clear that this is where we were going, and it was going to drive our strategies and behaviors at Coca-Cola. So it is a balance, because you don't want to get over your tips with Wall Street. But at the same time, people need to hear the same stuff wherever they go in, in terms of where the company was going. So we tended to over-communicate was the real answer. Yes?
Yeah, well, we did, and we talked about other lines of business that were, all, that were in the refreshment business, snacks, candies, uh, Pepsi was in the snack food business, for example. But when we looked and did the analysis internally, we saw that in our core strength, which was beverages, at the core carbonated beverages, but then broadening, there was opportunities if you broke the market down in, in bite-sized chunks. And it said, let's stay close to home, let's stay focus on what we can do best, and that's gonna carry us for another 15 years. And so that, it was a conscious decision to stay a little bit closer in. Okay, and then, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have seen different models for thinking about how to develop a plan. This is just a simple framework that I have found useful over a period of time. What, if, if you're going to 600 drinks, what are the assets that you have to work with? Well, you have a great brand, you have customer relationships, you've got a great employee base. What are the action steps? Well, for us, it was availability, affordability, acceptability. Who has to do what? What were the barriers? You know, that's very important. We realized we didn't have a great new product development department. We realized we didn't have enough vending machines on the street. We didn't have enough salespeople calling on stores across the United States. Those were barriers we had to address in the strategy. How can you overcome those barriers? And sometimes they're simple. You know, at Revlon, we were trying to strengthen the workforce and just by walking around the building one day, I, I walked into the head of staffing. And she's, I said, well, are we hiring good marketing people? And she said, we can't. I said, what's the barrier? She said, well, we don't have enough good recruiting materials. And I went back to my office and I made copies of five different analyst reports who said Revlon was going to turn the company around. And I said, okay, here's some materials. And just understanding the barriers that your folks are facing and helping to try to solve those problems as a leader can help get you there. And just listening to the challenges and the problems. And then finally, what do you expect to get back in terms of financial and marketplace results? So overall, just a ba very basic strategy model. Any thoughts or comments in response to that? Okay. Jack? Yes. I think the VC can't hear. That's just for the camera. Can you talk in front of that mic, unfortunately? For the okay, sure. Okay, this goes back to your question about communication. And can you all hear me? Okay, great. And communication is such an important part of the process. And I, I like to say as a leader, particularly in a change environment, when things are broken or you're trying to build something for the first time, whatever you think is required in terms of the amount of communication you're doing, double it and then double it again. And there are enough math majors in the room who can do that math. And you know, you're, all of a sudden you're multiples in terms of your communication effort beyond what you thought was necessary to move your organization. And it is just the nature of people. Uh, to your point earlier, how did you motivate the organization? You know, as a, when I went to Revlon, again, which was a company in trouble, not, not Google, a company that's going from great to greater, I made it a point of every week writing a letter myself that went to 5,000 people. And then every, every week, I would get on a global teleconference call and take any questions in response to that letter about the progress of the company, where Revlon was being successful with retailers, our new products, where they were working, where they weren't, and just spent an inordinate amount of time talking about the progress of our change pattern. And as a leader, I think that's the kind of effort that's required, particularly when you're on a rapid growth curve or you're trying to change an overall environment. And I would encourage you to think about your own level of communication as leaders with your team, with your customers, and is it adequate for the environment that you're operating in and given the goals that you're trying to achieve? Any questions or comment about, comments about communication generally or my point about what, what I, at least I believe is required? Yes? 
Did you ever go out on your own after this and then just kind of spot check and see if the average employee was getting that message? I did, and I'll make the point in a moment, but I set a goal at Revlon to try to have at least 100 one-on-one -on -one conversations a week. And, you know, whether that was in the elevator or in the parking lot, and I'm not talking about being part of a larger meeting or even a scheduled meeting, but at least 100 unscheduled conversations a week. And, if, you know, if a workday is five days, it's 20 a day. And, you know, if it's stopping someone in the elevator and saying, okay, tell me what you do, what challenges are you experiencing, are there things that you think I should be doing differently as, as your leader? And that was one way of kind of spot checking to your question about what messages were and weren't getting through. And it's amazing what, what didn't get through <laughs> for as much as we tried to communicate. Yes? I found you almost couldn't do too much. Um, and the problem is it takes, as a leader, it takes a lot of energy. You know, many of us are social people by nature, and some aren't. But even if you're a very social person by nature, having 100 conversations a week just tires you out, believe it or not. It can give you energy on one hand and tire you out. But I think most organizations that are, you know, if we say we're going to 600 at Coca-Cola, or if at Revlon we said we're going to deliver the promise of beauty and save the company from bankruptcy, you couldn't over-communicate. And, and I, it just, it had to be part of what you did every single day. Because you would find people wouldn't understand. Someone was writing that the company was in trouble, or an analyst would say that our products, our new products in lipstick and cosmetics weren't working. And you had to be constantly reinforcing what was working and, and what wasn't working. Any of you been in tough environments and have seen the power of communication or any examples that you all would want to provide that might be useful? Anything that jumps out at where you've seen that work or not work? Yes? I recently joined Google from a company called JDS Interface. And back in June of 2008, when I joined the company, in my mind, perhaps they were at their lowest. Later, our new CEO, uh, the CEO joined Tom Vector, and almost instantaneous in the first few weeks, the first set of changes he brought about was communication, as simple as company wide email newsletter. Right. And from that point on, it was site visits, uh, brown bags, and summer barbecue events where you turn up in person and meet with the people. And just that one part of it, just that communication from one person. Right. Changed the morale so much that you subsequently we saw that even now the stock price is definitely on the great. We need a space of year and a half that is as visible as it could be. Yep. Terrific example. Yes. So uh, I'm an admin and I am constantly trying to look at a calendar and figure out how to fit in every single meeting that you're talking about and have communications and all hands and you know, sending emails, meeting with people in person, meeting with groups of you know, all of these things. And I guess um, my question is sort of how do you fit it all in? How, um, how do you know which method is the best method? Is it better to do the all hands? Is it better to do one on ones? I mean, really, what is going to work the best? Because it doesn't seem like there's enough time to do all of those things. Right. Okay. Well, and I'm, I'm going to speak to that in a minute because I think that begins to get to, as a leader, how do you organize your own time and how do you maximize your own effectiveness. And part of it is, I think, the, the routines that you set up for yourself. What do you look at? How frequently? A weekly meeting, a monthly meeting, a routine report, and getting those routines set up that cover the things that are important to your business, that are strategic. If you get those routines set up properly, it's amazing how much time frees up for you to be more flexible to communicate on a broader fashion 
about what's happening in your organization. So part of it is around organizing your time. And I think part of it is just listening to your organization, letting them give you feedback for what tools are working or not as a communication effort. And sometimes you have to adjust. You know, at Revlon, we did, we did quarterly updates. And we got feedback that they didn't want to hear from me. They wanted to hear success stories from people that were actually making things happen in different parts of the company. I got off the stage. All I would do is introduce two or three people, and they would talk about how they made a sales call that worked, or they developed a new lipstick that sold like crazy, or they developed a market in Asia. And we shared success stories. It gave people hope. And, but we were getting feedback about the nature of our communication, and we were adjusting constantly. So I think that helps to prioritize. Yes? Uh, from sales, uh, we sell a range of products at Google. And I feel like each product team here has a leader. And each of those leaders is just communicating to the sales team. So in that kind of sense, sometimes we do get a little over communicated to. Right. Do you ever see a situation like that happening? And do you ever kind of organize differently because of that? Or reorganize maybe? Yeah. Um, I, I think. And I think that's uh, often, I've seen that often with sales teams because they've got external pressures that are real. They're called customers. And um, making sure that you're listening to your sales leadership about what works for them and what routines work for them and what don't, I think is very important. Uh, because, you know, you want those people out selling as opposed to necessarily only being focused on internal communication. So I think it comes back to, again, a matter of listening and just recognizing the importance of that external pressure that that salesperson is facing and making adjustments. Did you have something in mind when you were when thinking about that or just? No, yeah, I think that we're, we're working on ways to, I think, get those various teams in line and streamline that communication in the of teams. But right. it's just tricky because I think it's hard to know which products are going It's almost like setting some sort of system where um, they all communicate together. Yep. <laughs> it's possible. It's, I think there's probably no single solution that works. It is sometimes just trial and error. And this, this comes back to your question about um, how do you make it all work and given the time pressures. And I'm, I'm, I am really a big believer in kind of regularizing, if you, that's probably not a word, but setting routines around what it is we do as leaders. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, at Revlon, when I went to the company, I would walk around drugstores to see the cosmetics products on displays in a Walgreens or a CVS or wherever we were. And it was obvious that the different functions in the company were not talking to each other. And I found myself having a series of one-off meetings with sales, making sure they were talking to marketing about what products were coming out and operations. And my day was becoming jammed with one-off meetings. I finally set up on Monday morning at 7.30 a meeting with sales, new product development, operations, finance, where we talked about the new products that were coming out for the next month, the next quarter, and over the remainder of the year and who had responsibility for the product and what had to happen with sales and promotional material for the product to make it to the customer on time. And only by setting up those regular meetings did we get the right people in the room and it, it tended to minimize the amount of problems and crises that we're dealing with because stuff was happening real time in the room cross-functionally. And so being thoughtful about your control systems what you look at as a leader, the information that you see, the meetings that you participate in, all can, I think, buy you time to have real impact on your organization. Any thoughts or comments, reactions to this as you think about your own time and trying to maximize your own impact? Okay. Yes? Uh, I think one trade-off some on Sometimes we need to make is between how to move fast and be able to adapt in a more agile fashion instead of just going through a lot of process and being able to meet the pace. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. I, my, 
you know, and I was in a, in a business that at, at the cosmetics business or the beauty business, new products are very, very important. At least 20 to 25% of your business each year comes from products that weren't on the shelf six months ago. And you had to be fast in seeing a consumer need, getting a product developed, whether it be a face makeup or a nail enamel, and you had to be prepared to get it out the door as fast as you could. My experience was having the right routines, while they can be boring and repetitive, if you've got all the cross-functional people in the room, you know, make it up every week, and you're looking each person in the eye, the salesperson, okay, what issues do you see? What are we missing? And you get problems surfaced early, and then you can agree to follow up on that over the course of the next week, and take action, and then see if it happened. If you can uh, pull out from people what's causing the issues while it's tedious and time consuming, you're going to pull months out of the new product development process, for example. And so I, I think these, these control systems or management routines are critical, I think, to actually speeding up time as opposed to slowing it down, at least based on the businesses that I've been a part of. Excuse me. Any other thoughts or questions on that one? Comments? Okay. Execution. You know, leaders are sometimes thought, well, they should operate at the strategic level. I think the best leaders that I've seen operate at all levels. And they are very situational in deciding where to spend their time and energy. I'm going to give you an example. Um, at one point at Coca-Cola, I was responsible for taking the company public. And I had to develop what's called an offering circular. It's about a 300-page document that investors read. We were taking a bottling company public in Canada. And you had to get this document done that describes the company, the financials, the products, the system. And I was supposed to get it done with the help of the lawyers, the accountants, the tax people. And I thought, you know, and I would call up the lawyers and say, okay, is your section done? He said, yeah, we're coming. it's coming along. And uh, I call up the tax people, how's your section coming? You know, you got pages 32 through 60. Yeah, that's good, we'll be there. And my boss came into the room one night and he said, well, let's see your document. And we had about 20 people sitting around the table. And he, he gets to the first page of the document. Mind you, we're taking this company public. It's going to be a new company based in Canada. And he turns to the first page and he says, what's the phone number for the new company? And I said, the phone number. And I thought, well, I guess it is going to need a phone. And I said, well, we'll get that done, you know, the day before we file. And he said, well, why don't you do today what you can do today? You're going to have a lot to do the day before you file this document with the government. And at, at that point, I had this flash of pain in my mind, thinking, oh, my God, he's going to go through the whole document like this. And we did. We were there till 2.30 in the morning. There were 267 holes in the document like that, starting with the phone number, the address, certain financial data. And it told me that as a leader, and I was leading that project, that I need not assume good execution by my teammates. Now, when I saw it demonstrated by the lawyers, for example, or the tax people, I wouldn't have to worry about them. But until I saw some evidence at ground level that it was coming together, I was making a big mistake. And I was, I was like convinced I was going to get fired. And, you know, we sat there until 3 in the morning. And he t the guy took me home. He dropped me at my house. I, I thought that was my last day. And he looked at me and said, you'll catch up. You're about two weeks behind, but you'll catch up. And he knew I was going to experience that. Uh, he just knew as a leader, I needed to learn the lesson about the importance of focusing on the details. And I would just encourage you to think about that. It's not just focusing strategically. It is about knowing where to, to bore in and where you can pull back. And you have to be able to judge both. Any comments on this one? Yes, Alexander. I noticed over the years that there's a problem with the level of competence among uh, staff. Usually, people grow until they hit the level of incompetence, and then they stay at that position for a long time, creating documents in this period of time you just described. Right. How do you find that in the organization? How do you keep people aligned with their actual uh, abilities? I'm going to speak to that and just. Two clicks. 
and talks a little bit about people development. And it, it is a thinking about how to bundle those skills for people on a more systemic basis. So if you'll allow me just a moment. Another element of the framework we've talked about, so I'm not going to belabor it, the importance of being visible. And I talked to you about 100 one-on-one -on -one conversations per week. And just setting a target for being in touch with the people at all levels of your organization and across the organization. And setting yourself targets for doing that. I, at Coca-Cola, when I was president of the company, I kept a card in my pocket with the company's 100 largest customers from around the world. And I knew if I didn't call, at least try to call three every day, you know, I would, because I, my goal was to try to get to each of these top 100 customers about six times a year on the telephone. And I would just call and say, what's happening? How's Coca-Cola service? How's the account team servicing you? Anything I can do to be helpful to you? It was a two minute call. Sometimes I'd learn about something about their business where we could create value for them or a product. And so being visible to your people, to your team members, to other functions, to your customers, I think it's so important uh, as, as a leader, both learning and communicating what you believe is important. OK, what about developing people? And I think this speaks to your question, Alexander. I believe it's very important to demonstrate to people that you as a leader, particularly this is, this is a hierarchical uh, point to your question earlier, that you have people management responsibility. And I think to the extent that you can frame up for your organization, and I understand at Google, you, you, at some point you talk about universal skills, and you may or may not use that language today. But what we tried to do at Coke was develop something we call core skills that are important across all functions. And learning and questioning the, the environment around you. Do you read? Do you, are you out in the world? Are you seeing data that can, you can then use to connect to something that's important to you on the job? And asking questions about what's possible. You know, at Coke, the question was, why do we sell 600 drinks per person per year in Mississippi, but it's only 77 in California as a whole. And asking those questions that can point you to opportunities. That's a core skill that I think is important in any environment, whether you're coding or whether or not you're dealing with customers or leading a marketing operations team. Another important skill is developing a plan. We talked about a model to do that. Focusing on the details is critical. And you know, how is that lesson learned? as an example. I'll tell you how I learned it in addition to the story that I told earlier. At one point I was Coca-Cola's chief financial officer and I was going off to Vienna, Austria to review business plans. And I got to Vienna, I was scheduled to be there for a week. I had a long flight, I was looking forward to a great dinner. And I'd gotten to Vienna and I'd unpacked my suitcase and I had my shirts on the shelf and all my toilet articles were stacked up and everything. And I was looking forward to a nice dinner with my colleagues. And I got a call on the phone from the chairman of the company. His name was Roberto Goizueta, a very proper Cuban gentleman, actually, ran the company for about 20 years. And he said, Jack, I just got a financial report on, on about Spain, and the numbers are wrong. In the, it's a, and I said, Roberto, it's an internal company report. I know there's an error. My team is focused on it. I'll have an answer for you when I get back a week from today. And it was like he hadn't heard anything I said. He said, Jack, no, 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 you don't understand. What plane are you coming back to Atlanta on tomorrow morning? And I said, Roberto, I'm, I'm here for a series of budget meetings, and I'll be back a week from today. He said, and, and what plane did you say you're on tomorrow morning? And I said, well, I think there's a 9 o'clock. So I calmly got my shirts down off the shelf and my toilet articles, packed them into my little suitcase told my colleagues I wasn't going to be having dinner with them after all, and got on the plane the next morning. And you know, he was kind of reminding me about the importance of detail and getting it right and getting internal reports correct or whether it was that or calling on a customer or a project that you might be working on. I learned that lesson forever. You know, I never wanted to have to repack my suitcase <laughs> and you know, miss an important business trip, as an example. And I think just 
looking for ways to remind people about that skill and these other skills are critical. It's constant reinforcement. It's constant conversation with your people. It's asking them about their challenges in these areas, helping think through solutions. It's dialogue. And I think with that, you've got a much better shot at developing an organization with, a, with core skills that they can use in any environment, whether it be at Google or somewhere else. And so I think it's about conversation and investing in your people. And people did it for me, and I learned, and I make it a point to do it with the people that I have responsibility for. So I think the most important thing is in building organizational capability is dialogue and being clear about what counts. Any reactions or thoughts to this one? Because people development is so critical, particularly, I would think, in an organization like this one that's growing so fast and having cap capable people to lead it becomes increasingly critical. Any thoughts or, yes? Yeah, I have, I have this conversation a lot with people because I'm involved in a bunch of different organizations. And my view is, you know, the, if, if your goal is to advance in a business environment, is let your focus be one of skills orientation. And a lot of people have an orientation, gee, I want to get exposure to different marketplaces or different parts of the business. My view has always been decide what skills are important and find an area where you can learn these core skills or those that might work at Google or somewhere else and find people that is will are willing to invest in you and have conversations about where you're getting it right and where you can do it better. And then once you've learned these core skills, you can take them anywhere. You know, at, at an early point in my career, before I had learned many of these skills, I was at Coke in Atlanta, and the thought was you should go international. And I was, I was asked to go move to Germany to be like the assistant controller. I was like 26 or 20. That was a big job for me when I was 26 or 27. But the guy that I was working for in Atlanta said, don't go to Germany. That person's not going to teach you those skills. And I got five or six different jobs in Atlanta, and I moved very well. I made more than my share of mistakes. He let me do that, as I indicated. But I found I could take those skills out of a financial environment and take them to a general management role, running the U.S. business. I'm convinced if I'd focused on something different than the core skills and focused on just exposure, exposure to Germany or a different business, I'd, I'd still be in Germany today, you know, as like the number two control person in Germany, which for me, would have been a missed opportunity. So for me, it's my experience and what I, where I've seen people move and create the most options is decide what skills are important, who can help me learn them, and stay where you get the opportunities on projects or different roles to learn them, because then it creates options. So that's just one perspective on it. Um, that really is the framework that I wanted to share with you from setting a destination all the way through how to, how to think about developing your own people by setting a clear set of expectations and investing in the dialogue and conversation. But I really believe that this framework can be applied in a lot of different environments. So let me stop there and see if there are any other questions that I could address or thoughts that you all would like to, to throw out. Yes. So you mentioned ownership once. Um, where, does, where does that fit in? In other words, in assigning or, or trying to make sure that people own the things that are important to themselves. Well, I, I think I think that notion of ownership is, in a sense, something you can hire against. And you're looking at, at wherever I've been, whether it's been at, at Coca-Cola or at Revlon you were looking for people that really, you know, felt very strongly about the work that they did or the projects that they had been responsible for in the past. Could they give you examples of where they really dug in and made things happen, where they focused on the details, where they set a clear strategy? 
and really felt like they had the responsibility for the success or failure of something. And I think that's, that attitude and looking for it as you recruit and give people more responsibility is, I think, critical. Because I think if people have that and they have a set of core skills, that attitude and those core skills, I think chances are they're going to get off to a reasonable start in most roles or most environments. Bright people will, and you all are bright. Yes? Um, so I was just curious how, in your, I feel like many of you are drawing your bright wall, like, I'm sure you got set, I'm probably all the time, got offers to go to other places to go work. What, what kind of went through your head, and how did you ultimately decide when it was the right time to make that move, and why was the right on that? Why did you do that way? I'm sure you could have gone many other conversions of different types of companies. I felt at Coca-Cola, I had been part of a very big company. And by that time I left, the basic processes worked. We had a planning process. We had ways of calling on customers. And it wasn't all perfect. We made tons of mistakes. But there, all the basic disciplines were pretty well defined. And what I wanted to do at the next stage of my career was do something that was a little bit more entrepreneurial and operate in a place that all that stuff wasn't working. And I really wanted to see if I could help create it and build it. And, and help turn a company around. So it was about that kind of challenge for me. It, it could have been in any industry. I just happened to get a call about running a beauty company, which seemed a little bit crazy. And I, I'm convinced at Coke, we always wore white shirts and blue shirts. The only reason this guy hired me was because that day I had a particularly colorful shirt on. Otherwise, he would have said, no, no, he's a boring soft drink guy. He can stay there. But I, for me, it was about being more entrepreneurial at that stage of my career than I had been up until that point. I thought it would be interesting for me. We have time for one more. Okay. Yes. So uh, most of the things that you have asked today were about business leadership and management. Do you think quality matters uh, in terms of Google is what it is right now because of the search quality, and Honda what it is right now because of like the car quality? Do you think if you had uh, Coca-Cola based on sugar rather than HSCS, you would have sold 700 things per person? <laughs> um, well, it, that's, a, that's a, I think when we made that switch from high fructose corn syrup to sugar, you know, we viewed it as a very important part of the formulation of Coca-Cola. But we did a tremendous amount of research which said that both from a health standpoint, a taste standpoint, even a mouthfeel standpoint, which is an important part of a beverage, that the product was not differentiatable. You couldn't really tell the difference. Um, and the economics of high fructose corn syrup were much better than refined sugar. And so we thought, OK, if we can adopt a lower cost sweetener for our products, it gives us more money to reinvest in the brands and create more growth. And so I know that there's some concerns today about HFCS. But from a taste standpoint, uh, there is no fundamental difference. And you believe that? Yes. You, you, you can't tell the difference? No. And I can, and, and just having been in a beverage company for so many years, I can virtually smell the difference between Coke and Pepsi, for example. Oh, and. But I, can, I couldn't taste the difference between sugar and high fructose corn syrup. I promise. We could do it. No, we can't. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you all very much.